What's up, everybody? Hey, everyone. How are we on this wonderful Tuesday? Yo, how are you all doing? Happy Tuesday. Happy day of um, Microsoft's cloud gaming being launched. That is Crazy. right. It is the official launch of their cloud gaming service, which initial reviews were actually pretty strong about it. So oh, really? Curious to see when it's now widespread how well it does. Dang, me too, but we're gonna be getting into that later. Um, we're gonna start off um, with an eSports roundup uh, carried over from yesterday. That's right, we're also gonna talk about, as we just discussed, that, that Game Pass Ultimate is available with the cloud gaming service with more than 150 games. We're gonna talk about how Microsoft snubs Apple's olive branch to cloud gaming and calls it a bad experience for customers. Also gonna discuss how GameStop is closing hundreds of more stores. Then we're going to watch an animated short that's new from Star Wars Squadrons. And jumping into the reported cut of PlayStation 5's initial production orders that is coming out of Sony. We're going to update you on the PS5 Showcase event, which actually starts tomorrow at 1 p.m. So we're going to be live reacting to that, but we'll let you know, you know, what's coming up, what you should expect for that. And uh, something interesting on the side of EA is that they're killing off the origin name entirely. If we have time, we're going to get into Amnesia Rebirth, which is a new Amnesia game coming October 20th. Talk about the Prince of Persia Sands of Time uh, rewinds for a faster mo remake. And as always, what's in the mug? What's in the mug today, everybody? Cheers. Um, welcome, new and returning DGNers. Uh, for those of you who don't know who we are, I am Kaisa. I am Marone, and we bring you daily gaming news where Monday through Friday, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we get on this lovely stream here and share what's going on in the gaming industry. So we're going to get started with this eSports roundup of some eSports news. Um, we, we're not really going to get into the nitty gritty of certain players being traded because unless you're following those eSports, that probably won't mean a ton to you. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the truth there. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about the CDL, how in uh, the 2021 season of the Call of Duty League officially started on September 14th yesterday, and the league has already introduced another major change. Starting the season, all games will be played on PC with controller, and the CDL announced this, and it means that all pro players won't be allowed to use a mouse or a mouse and keyboard, even though they'll be playing on PC, and that controller must be approved by the league. They Is said he this... Oh, sorry. Sorry, no, go, go ahead. I was, they just said this, that as a part of the transition, Call of Duty League competition will maintain exclusive use of controllers for the upcoming season. And the switch comes out over after a decade of professional Call of Duty esports being exclusively played on consoles. Which seems like a big change because they used to be playing on, you know, PlayStations. And we were thinking that there's maybe a deal with PlayStation and, you know, some of these esports tournaments. Um, I feel like that would, you know, drive a lot of sales, you know, especially with all these setup for these events. But now it's all on PC. Yeah, it's pretty odd. A lot of people are like, wait, I'm going to be on PC, but I can't play with mouse and keyboard. No, you can't. You got to play with controller. What is interesting is when you play that game, you do realize there are aspects of controller play that feel way stronger than what you get with mouse and keyboard play. So interesting. maybe that's it. But you know, I, I you know I've got my controller ready because I'm like maybe I should start playing a controller more. Maybe. Um, chat has already guessed this is water. I have my Invisalign <laughs> in, so I can only drink water. Big bummer. My orthodontist kind of yelled at me today. So I'm like, oh, hey. all right. All right, I'll wear them. Uh, Calm down, orthodontist. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. Step back. I'm trying. Uh, so into CSGO news, Cloud9 will be building a CSGO roster with six active players. The organization CSGO general manager Henry, Henry G. Greer, said yesterday on HLTV confirmed the website's weekly show that it's a bit of a trend at this point, adding a sixth player when you need to when everything starts to fall apart the general manager however wants to have a sixth player from the beginning he said i'm going to have an active sixth player who is not going to be on the bench and go ahead no, 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 go for it, go okay. for it. Okay, C9's, we usually switch off for paragraphs. Don't, don't mind us, yeah. chat. Um, C9's sixth player will be actively playing and will be a sort of brand ambassador, according to Henry G. It'll be someone who hasn't made it to the top, but they must have potential and experience at big land tournaments. It's not to keep the players on their toes, Henry G said. The world has proven to be very unpredictable, so if we have travel issues, if we have someone who falls ill, I want to have a very competent player who knows the role and everything we're doing and is a very versatile player. So I have some mixed feelings 
about this. I think that makes sense, you know, to have a sub, to have a backup there. I also hated when I was on a team and, you know, the coach tried to make you play better by always threatening yeah. to swap you out. And I realized that's a strategy, but it never felt good to me. No, uh, it doesn't. I don't think it actually works I as never much felt as coaches it worked. think it works. And that's the thing as a player. I mean, I played football for 10 years all the way up through college. I've always felt like I, I wanted to have a discussion with my coaches to be like, you know, I know you learned this behavior from the coaches that you came up under, but maybe some of these things you should reconsider because they're not really getting through. And in fact, they're probably causing me to just zone out whenever you talk, you talk or speak to me and, and not really like care what you have to say, mm -hmm. which is why I gravitated towards coaches who were more like, we're on the same level. I'm going to try to teach you and you just, understand that and respect that right I'm, I'm glad you kind of have the same feelings because i only played sports in like high school and i didn't you know play in college or anything like that but whenever there were like threats of people being swapped out or some people being on varsity and others being on, on on jv you know and people being swapped around between those teams it just made players really resentful um and i noticed that the coach that was just really you know encouraging and just had everyone work together you know try your best we'll switch you out and you get tired that kind of mentality that team played way better i think because yep. they could just focus on the game and not these like mind games of if they're going to get replaced or not. Right. Yeah. It's it's morale boosting, you mm -hmm. know, instead of uh, uh, trying to bring someone down with hopes that the the fire will build them up when when ultimately they're just like, I already deal with enough stuff <laughs> outside of here, and you demeaning me and threatening to remove me is not helping whatsoever. Um, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how the response is. Right, right, totally. And, you know, apparently the sixth player is in case, you know, something bad happens. But, um, yeah, we'll see if it's actually used that way or if that's more of kind of an excuse to have a sixth player on there. Yeah. And uh, moving over to the OWL, we're actually going to talk about how after years of defining the meta in the Overwatch League, Kem Pleta young son can add another accolade to his resume as most valuable player as the shanghai dragons dps was awarded the 2020 mvp title for his stellar play during the season as well as his deep hero pool. so that is our esports roundup for today the owl mvp um, a little bit of csgo news and a little bit of cdl news but we're gonna get into cloud gaming with the xbox game pass ultimate which did launch today so Xbox Game Xbox Games Pass Ultimate members can play via the cloud in 22 countries starting today at no additional cost. You're going to find fantastic curated selections of games available in the Xbox Games Pass library, including popular games by Xbox Game Studios, titles such as Tell Me Why, Grounded, Forza Horizon 4, and Battletoads. Along with favorites from our content partners, this is Microsoft speaking, like Spirit Fairer, Untitled Goose Game, and Destiny 2. Similar to Xbox Games Pass for consoles and PC, you can expect that the library to evolve over time based on feedback from our members, with new games being added all the time. If you're an Xbox Game Pass Ultimate member, you can discover the freedom and flexibility the cloud brings to your gaming experience. Again, this is from Xbox themselves. I wanted to delve into their language to really see their pitch on why you should sign up for cloud gaming. So Xbox states that one of the key benefits of cloud gaming is that it gives you more choices in how to play. Because your Xbox profile resides in the cloud, you can easily continue your Wasteland 3 playthrough that you began on your living room Xbox console on your Android phone or tablet. It's perfect for those times when you want to get in a gaming session while away from home or when your shared TV or console is occupied. With the cloud, a game like Sea of Thieves can transform into a great couch co-op experience with multiple people playing across console, PC, and mobile devices in the same room. Additionally, cloud gaming as a part of the Xbox Games Pass Ultimate now opens up the world for Xbox to those who may not own a console at all. With an Xbox Games Pass Ultimate membership, Gamers need only an Android phone or tablet and a supported controller to join in on the fun of Xbox gaming while enjoying the full benefits of the Xbox ecosystem. This includes friends, achievements, parties, and voice chat, cloud saves, and the ability to enjoy multiplayer games with other gamers, irrespective of whether they have or, are, or whether they are playing on console or via the cloud. You can also play with PC players in games where crossplay with Xbox One consoles is supported such as Horizon, Forza Horizon 4, Gears 5, and more. 
Xbox states that finally, cloud gaming with Xbox Game Pass Ultimate makes it easier than ever before to play games with your friends. Because members have access to a common library, members immediately have dozens of multiplayer games at their disposal that they can play together. And best of all, if you're playing together via the cloud, the games are all ready to go, so you and your friends can all jump in and start playing in seconds. Whether you're playing with friends on Xbox One, or if you're playing with someone experiencing Xbox for the first time through cloud gaming on a mobile device, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate brings you together and makes for the best gaming experience according to Xbox. And 150 plus titles is huge. Let's really take that into account. You're talking about cloud gaming launching for, for the Xbox Game Pass today, Microsoft's you know uh, X Cloud, and the amount of titles that they have on here. We have this list, so just some that we'll throw out there is like, uh, when you take a look at like some of the ones that they mentioned, uh, like Forza uh, uh, Horizon 4, you also have uh, something like like uh, 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 Gears of War 1, 4, and 5, as well as like State of D Decay 2, Subnautica, Terraria, it's it's a long list. It's a really long list, and I uh, deleted some of the the names from this list that you see there on your screen, Maroon. The, it's so huge. There's Blair Witch, DayZ, Dead by Daylight, Dead Cells, Dirt Four, um, all the Gears of War, Goat Simulator, Halo Five, Hypnospace Outlaw, Human Fall Flat, the Ori games, Overcooked, Resident Evil Seven, Sea of Thieves, Spirit Farers. I mean, it goes on and on and on. It really does with all the Walking Dead titles, the Jackbox Party Pack. I mean, it, it, it is The Outer Worlds, Witcher 3, Wild Hunt, Yakuza games, uh, World War Z. There's so many titles on here that you can actually have an amazing experience with friends and in multiplayer sessions that you have access to. And all you need is that Android phone or device and a, and a compatible controller and you're ready to start playing. I really like their pitch for cloud gaming that, you know, if someone's using your TV, for example, you can go and yeah. play on your phone. I'm like, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, it seems like in the past, cloud gaming seems like, oh, you can play on the go. And I'm like, well, if I'm on the go, I'm driving usually, or, you know, in a place where, where I'm probably not gonna sit down and play a game. But this idea that, you know, you can play with your friends if you have a different device, you know, a lot of households might have an iPad and a TV, you know, and, and people have phones. There's all those options to be able to play games on instead of, you know, fighting over who gets to use the Xbox at that one time, I think is a really cool pitch. Um, also that, you know, you can have all your friends on there. And if your friends have Game Pass, you know, you're gonna have access to all these different types that you can play together versus being like, hey, did you buy Fall Guys? Oh, I don't know. I don't really want to spend the money on it. Oh, well, I have it. Okay, I guess we can't play it. We're going to play something else. You know, this is where you can have a whole library of games you can play together. Really is it, it um, in terms of like bang for your buck, that, that this is supersedes what you're spending mm -hmm. and getting. And, and right. to, to the point that you made, of like if someone else is using the console or, or using PC and you can't play, like I don't know if I would jump in to see if Thieves want to play that on my phone, but if I had a tablet mm -hmm. with a big enough screen where I could really appreciate the graphics, right. you could actually start to see the sale of tablets go up where people are like, I'm just going to use this as my xCloud you know, gaming device mm -hmm. uh, for when I want to play it, have some friends over, we want to play Overcooked 2, however it is we want to go about this gaming session. Because again, as much as like, some of these phones are getting bigger. Some of these games, you just need a larger screen in order you to do. appreciate the graphics. But something like Terraria, you're like, okay, I can play that mobile and it's not too too big of a deal of, of, of loss in, in, in terms of size. Right, and and I think like if, for example, if I had friends over, which I can't because hashtag pandemic, but if if I did someday in the future, you know, I have a tablet, um, albeit it's uh, an Apple one, and we're gonna get into how we can't, you know, use this on the, use this with Apple devices, so I guess that doesn't count, but you know, if, if I did have a tablet that I could actually use with this or an Android phone, you know, I'd be able to have friends over and be able to have a multiplayer experience without, you know, having to invest in like all the different controllers, making sure I have enough joy cons, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Artistic says the only reason I don't do Xbox like that is the controller doesn't fit right in your hands. Otherwise you'd be down with this. So they have like a special kind of device that you can add onto your phone as like a quasi controller, I believe for yeah. xCloud, but I wonder how much it's actually going to be used. For sure, and, and and to Guff's question too is like, or at least expression of, I want to know uh, the the latency. Initial reviews of people who got into the uh, like like the closed um, testing phase of this said that there was little to to none in terms of the latency, and that they wow. were very surprised by how smooth the gameplay uh, was and carried out. We're gonna mm -hmm. find that out obviously with more people going to use it, 
actually testing it out and the masses giving giving a, a feedback. So we'll keep our eye on on questions like that. Throw that into our mailbag because it could be like yeah. a week or so from now that we need to come back and circle on the the X Cloud and see how it is. Uh, but yeah, those are those are great questions and comments regarding this next stage in gaming, especially cloud gaming. We definitely will to get those updates. So let's get into Microsoft's reply right. to Apple. And so Apple kind of offered an olive branch to Microsoft saying like, hey, you know, we're going to allow, you know, we're going to allow cloud gaming. And Microsoft was kind of like, no, nah, not that way, though. No, because I think we already knew Microsoft's stance regarding Apple, especially mm. surrounding the Epic Games thing. So Apple issued this new App Store rules that it, it, it had on Friday, permitting game streaming services like xCloud or Stadia to exist on iOS or iPad OS with a big catch. Apple wants companies like Microsoft to individually submit their games as separate apps using its streaming tech. Microsoft and Google are free to create a catalog, quote unquote, catalog style app that collects and links out all of these individual apps as well. So I'm just visualizing, okay, I'll click on, you know, xCloud and then it'll send me to another Witcher app that I'm gonna have, which I think the whole point of cloud gaming is that it's easy and instantaneous. So I feel like those yes. extra steps sound horrible. Um, Microsoft is also not impressed at all. They said that this remains a bad experience for customers. Gamers want to jump directly into a game from their curated catalog within one app, just like they do with movies or songs, and not be forced to download over a hundred apps to play individual games from the cloud. They said, we're committed to putting gamers at the center of everything we do and providing a great experience is core to that mission. So if Microsoft were to follow Apple's suggestions, it would mean that every single game streamed on an iPhone or iPad from xCloud would be subject to Apple's usual App Store rules, including the company's contentious 30% cut of in-app purchases. It's a cut that's at the center of the legal battle between Apple and Epic Games, and one that has caught the attention of regulators in the US and EU. Microsoft purposely raises a point about streaming movies or songs not facing the same content restrictions as games. Apple doesn't force Netflix, Disney Plus, or Spotify to submit submit each individual movie, TV show, or album into a separate app, but for some reason Apple treats games differently in its app store, and the company extracts large amounts of revenue from in-app purchases related to games. Gaming is the biggest part of the app store and the biggest entertainment industry in the US, an industry that Apple hasn't competed in seriously until Apple Arcade. And Microsoft's statement doesn't say whether the company will or will not rework xCloud to work with Apple's new rules. Apple's olive branch with its many caveats may still open the door for some form of game streaming from Microsoft or Google, as long as both companies are willing to pay the price. I felt like their olive branch wasn't really anything. It was kind of like, oh, we're not going to make exceptions for you, but there is this really horrible, cumbersome workaround that we made cumbersome and horrible on purpose for you. <laughs> yeah, I still don't know as it's it's probably a sense of they don't care, but Apple yeah. isn't addressing this 30% issue no. that these big you know players in the industry are are, uh, are pointing out is that's a ridiculous thing for all in-app purchases. Uh, maybe if it was just the purchase of the title, mm -hmm. okay, that's it. And then anything, you know, microtransaction-wise within the game is not touched or it's not carried over into that. But the fact that that 30% sits it on it across the board, that's, a, that's just crazy to think that you should deserve 30% of what someone's paying for for content that you're just housing. It is. And, you know, even when I think about, you know, Twitch subs and how that relates to that, people, when they sub on mobile, you know, it costs, I think, probably around 30% more. And it's more expensive on mobile. And everyone just goes, oh, just subscribe to your streamer on, on PC. Just go to desktop or try to open it in browser. Like, people aren't going to be like, oh, yes, the convenience of using this on my Apple device. I will gladly pay a higher price. Consumers don't feel that way at all. And also, like, having all these apps defeats the purpose of of cloud gaming, if yeah. I have the Netflix app on my phone and I have to download like how to get away with murder app, does that mean like all those episodes have to be pre-downloaded if someone says like, I don't have that kind of memory on my phone? No, that, and that would also just become a complete headache where yeah. it's just like, I thought this whole thing was to feel like I'm streaming, like I am Netflix, like you were just referencing. So when I hit right. the game that's here on the xCloud, it immediately is there and I'm ready to play it. 
mm-hmm. you know, especially if there's like DLC, say you complete a game like The Outer Worlds and you want to get the new DLC, which just dropped, do I have to down? Do I have to spend the time to download that? Oh god! And then open that in a different app, like The Witcher Three you reference as well. They have like four DLCs. It's the same thing that I, I don't, I don't know what it is going on <laughs> over there at Apple. It just doesn't seem that they actually care. They're greedy, and th- and it feels like that's what it is is propelling all of their decision making. Mm-hmm. Um, and the more this continues to drag on, the more I'm like, am I gonna switch back to Android? I have been an Apple iPhone user since like the iPhone 3 or something, oh, wow. and I think I'm going to switch to Android next. Wow. Yeah, see, I was yeah. an Android fanboy for a long time. I loved all the different aspects of jailbreaking and things like that that you could do <laughs> with the phone because I was like, I'm going to modify it because I can. It's here. Uh, but yeah, then I jumped over to Apple for like FaceTime and different features because all my family had, had, had Apple devices, but mm-hmm. it just is like... Even now, this whole situation, I'm like, I don't know if I want to contribute any money towards them right now. I know. And Waffle says, imagine saying in like 2005, Microsoft would be the good guys and Apple the bad. (laughs) (laughs) Microsoft's cool now. Take notes. That's really, yeah. They're taking that kind of like Phil Spencer approach (laughs) to their their public persona and, and, and really just trying to, it seems that Microsoft's like, hey, we're trying to get on the side of consumers. Mm-hmm. They right. they really have 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 presented themselves even with their price points like we're talking about with their next gen consoles and the way mm-hmm. they're handling you know this type of, of drama uh, right. they really do do seem to be like hey we're on the side of the people who support us and lift us up right that's what it feels like you know with the Xbox One it started to feel like they were trying or they were starting to get out of touch with their consumer base but now I feel like. You know, they're, they're more Xbox fans. I feel like they've kind of changed some of their branding as well to be a little less, a little less gamer-y. I mean, you still saw, you know, from their um, from their showcase about xCloud, it's still all like green and black, and, you know, very Xbox branded. Um, but I think that they've done a good job, you know, with the Game Pass, with the Xbox Series S um, to really get back into the mainstream of, you know, what people want to buy. Yeah, and just seeing some of the comments in the chat from like Kane talking about, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to 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 Android and Supple even saying Android is flex, flexible. It's like these are choices that I that that's the part of like I don't know if they realize the the ripple effect of these decisions being made um, that they might start to lose a large percentage of, of customer base that are predominantly gamers <laughs> who are like mm, I don't want to have to deal with this and I actually want that cloud gaming feature so that I can experience you know some of these titles that I, I, I can't because I can't afford to go out there and buy the, the new consoles or, or have a gaming PC, but I can still be allotted some of those experiences with a mobile device and compatible controller. Right, absolutely. I, I think the big draw for Apple for a lot of people was, you know, the camera quality um, and, you know, photo editing on there. But I feel like now on, you know, Android devices, it's pretty comparable. And I don't think yeah. it's, you know, a, such a strong selling point anymore. Yeah, I, I want to, you know what, we'll probably circle back on this in like a, a few weeks and see where that's happening. Does, is the user base shifting? Is the percentage yeah. happening? I wonder if there's a way of seeing like the the, the data on on how many people are jumping over and, and re- revolting against Apple's ways. Right. <laughs> we'll have to look out to see if there's any data on that. Um, and we'll definitely keep you updated with what's going to happen with Apple um, in this big fight with, you know, Epic Games and Microsoft and how that's going to continue to unfold. And another big fight that's happening is GameStop fighting for survival because it is closing hundreds of more stores. GameStop is closing about 100 more stores than it originally planned with the struggling retailer warning of more closures next year. So the company said in last Wednesday's earnings call that between 400 and 450 stores globally will close this year which is more than the 320 stores GameStop originally said in March that it was planning to shutter. The increase underscores how badly retailers are performing during the pandemic as shoppers are shifting their habits online. GameStop Chief Financial Officer Jim Bell said in the call that the closures will allow us to more efficiently and profitably service our customers. He added there are more to do, meaning closures, in 2021 as well. Its second quarter of online sales soared 800%, amounting to 20% of its total sales. However, its revenue came in below analysts' expectations and same-store sales, which were affected by temporary closures because of the virus. 
which declined to 12.7%. And those shares skyrocketed down 10% in pre-market trading. It's dismal 2020 follows an equally rough 2019 when it was stung by falling sales of physical video games, one of the company's mainstays. GameStop currently has 5,122 stores worldwide, which is 600 fewer than it did last year. And just like, uh, um, uh, yeah, Sequazi was saying, it's like, that is a lot of stores. That is, it's a lot of jobs. Uh, that's a lot of livelihoods being affected. GameStop's really got to sit down and figure out a way to, like, either re-envision themselves, reband mm -hmm. themselves, like, you know, be like a phoenix and rise from the ashes. They, I think they have the name that they could do that, but the mm -hmm. approach and what they come up with is very, very important uh, because there is kind of like what Apple's doing with, with its, you know, public uh, perception. There is a, a very mixed public perception of, of GameStop. There is, especially when all those articles came out about the treatment of its workers and there was a lot of bad news bears over there. Um, I, <laughs> I'm i surprised they haven't really pivoted their strategy, it seems. I think we were talking about how Reggie fils May was added to the board, yeah. um, but I don't think we've really seen any updates of you know what he's been doing or what GameStop has been doing to evolve and to change. Um, I think there are a lot of things they could do. I mean, I am no business expert. You know, I I am, I am no consultant, um, but a lot of people talk about Best Buy when it comes to a brick and mortar store that has actually been doing really well. Um, I still buy things at Best Buy, especially yep. if it's maybe something really expensive that I don't want, you know, to get lost in the mail or something or stolen from my doorstep. You know, I'll, I'll buy it from Best Buy and go to the store and still pick it up. You know, that's yep. still something valuable. Or, you know, when it comes to giving gifts, like even if there aren't physical copies, I'll still buy the physical card with like the game code on it. It's a to give it to someone as a gift. Um, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, value still there. Um, people, you know, going to GameStop to buy pre-orders of Animal Crossing and physical copies. Like, even during the pandemic, people wanted to go, which I have to officially advise against. Um, but there is still the demand there for people to go to GameStop locations. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Charmer's comment. If they fixed their trading system earlier, maybe they wouldn't be here now. I think that is a very big root issue with GameStop was the trade-in values. You were like, oh, I get to trade in my used games. And they're, and they're like, hey, I'll give you $2. We're going to resell right. it for 30. You're yeah. like, <laughs> what? Like, um... And it just felt, I think that was the thing that 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 is kind of feel from, from, from Apple was like this, oh, you guys are just greedy. You guys just mm -hmm. want as much money as possible. And that's where I'm kind of like, They've they they've got it they've got it I, I think they can use this time now to make a big change for the company and mm -hmm. shift just in the opposite direction of what they've become known as right. and known for. Mm -hmm. And if they were to do that, I think with the amount of people who have used GameStop in their lifetime, especially gamers and parents who don't even game that go to GameStop to buy games because that's where they know the location is. Right. Um, if they make this shift they could do very well and gain a lot of momentum moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. They just really got to sit down and figure out what that is. And like some of the options you were just discussing there and what, what some of the individuals are saying in chat, it really could, I, I think it's necessary in order for them to not just basically be gone. I, I think so too. I, I don't know, you know, what the changes have been. Uh, other ideas that I, I just thought of was they're kind of turning into maybe kind of like a Newberry Comics, Hot Topic, kind of, there's a lot of toys or like Funko Pops or kind of things that you see at GameStop, but they haven't really pivoted to those either. As Kane says, you know, you can just go online to buy a lot of things. So what is their, you know, reason for for being a physical physical location? You know, them closing stores, I, I think, Maybe they could use some of those people to go online for maybe like customer service or, you know, I think yeah. there's there's a way to, you know, move around certain jobs and to not just lay people off. It seems like they've just been slowly dying for so long now. Yeah. I'm honestly surprised that they're still kicking. Yeah, I, I am, too. They 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 hopefully are like, hey, we're just waiting for the vaccine to hit and then the world to get back to what is the new normal where we're mm. actually functioning out and about and we have a plan and we, we have, you know, some, some, some approach. Uh, hopefully it's not the same. That that's the one thing I think if, if, if they do survive mm -hmm. and they make it and they're still around, but they continue their old ways. I think that will be the nail in the coffin for GameStop where it'll actually be like, yeah, they're a lost cause. They don't, they're not gonna, they're not actually understanding uh, what gamers want. 
I, I think so. Um, so we'll keep an eye on this story, but it seems like we already know there's going to be more stores closing yeah. next year. Um, but I'm curious to see, you know, if they're going to pivot, if they're going to change their strategy, um, if yeah. GameStop is going to get a revival. Yeah, I, I, I hope so, and I, I hope so for all those people who've, who've, who've lost their jobs and been directly affected by, by these, these decisions and these closures. Absolutely. Um, but our next story is a new animated Star Wars Squadrons short, which recently came out. So if you just can't wait for the release of Star Wars Squadrons next month, because this, this game looks so cool, EA has something to ease the pain. <laughs> So they released a new seven minute animated short, which serves as a standalone story introducing one of the main characters from Squadron's single player campaign. It centers on an Imperial pilot named Varko Gray, the one left behind from a massive battle. There are tense dogfights, lots of flaming Star Destroyers, and all of the musical cues you'd expect from Star Wars. EA says the short was made in collaboration with Squadron's developer Motive, as well as Lucasfilm and ILM. The game, which lets players pilot classic Star Wars ships in both a story-driven campaign and squad-based multiplayer, will launch on October 2nd on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. Kang Guardian got the guess with the lemonade. She's like, what's the what's the oddball <laughs> choice that he makes? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's that lemonade. Good job. They've got what's in the mug for us today. Good nice, job, yeah. Good job. Good job. Cheers. Cheers to that. So let me know when you got your trailer up ready so I can start at the same time as you. I am opening it now. Cool. All right, I'm going to press play in three, two, one, play. It's like we're watching a Star Wars movie. Oh, completely. Yeah. Star Wars is is that intellectual property that always gives me like goosebumps when I hear the music and the sound that I've known to grow in love. Fighters, return to the overseer for extraction. Captain, come in. This is Titan 3. I'm pinned down. Come on, we still have ties out. We're not handing the enemy one more destroyer, Captain. The Overseer is leaving. I'm not gonna make it. Yeah, the music is so good. The sound design is so good. Thanks, Greg. Oh, I thought I was done for. Get to the hangar, pilot. So apparently this is a standalone story. Yeah. For those asking. And it features one of the main characters from the campaign of Squadrons. We're gonna be getting all this storytelling now with, with Star Wars, even in video games. It's great. I'm curious who the writers are. Mm-hmm. Between this game and Boundary, you'll be all set with your space shooters and Completely. <laughs> spaceship games. Oh my god. Go from playing this to going to playing Boundary? Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> 
So Kane says, Star Wars fans? I've never watched a movie. Yeah, but hey, Baby Yoda is all kinds of cute. So what I really like about, you know, a lot of the latest Star Wars games is you don't really have to have seen the movies. You don't, yeah. you know, since this is choice. standalone, yeah, you can just jump in um, and yet yeah, not have to, you know, do hours of homework, watch all the movies right. to just enjoy these games. Yep. They've gone about it the, the right way that brings yeah. more people in. And apparently in game you'll have to look at your you know your your screens and your information yes. and actually you know use your radar and stuff right your hud in in yeah. the cockpit is extremely important to your your survival and, and success yeah it sounds complicated it looks kind of complicated Well, I think of it like playing with like a mini map and paying attention to your ammo True. and things like that that you already are used to in like a first person shooter. There he is. <laughs> Slow motion reveal. Yeah. <laughs> I hope he's kinds of battles are going to happen in the game because I assumed it was all going to be in space and not actually on planets. Yeah. Maybe in the campaign. If we're talking like on planet battles. Yeah. That's going to be cool. Is anybody else conflicted? Nice. Like this is an Imperial. Like... <laughs> You want this person to die. Like, I'm sorry, like, <laughs> you want the evil to lose. <laughs> and we just watched a good guy. <laughs> I'm so conflicted. I'm so conflicted. Right, Guff's like, why am I rooting for the, that's how I felt this whole time. I was like, I'm not okay with this. How cinematic. Seriously. Getting a free, you know, film like this. Yeah. They did a good job. They did a great job. So cool. That was solid. That was like a whole little movie. Yeah, that's that's the part of it that I'm like, man, this free content is great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to look at the comments here below the video. This was amazing. Got goosebumps multiple times while watching. I'd love to watch an entire series with these graphics. Um, people saying they're simping for Star Wars. <laughs> Because we live in 2020 and that's how people talk. <laughs> that, is, that is how people talk. You know what's great is is I love that this game is right around the corner. Um, five on five. You know, we had a few Star Wars like Rogue Squadron games that did very well with the, the, the space battles. And now we're getting mm -hmm. to see PC, PS4, Xbox One, uh, what it's going to be like with updated graphics. It's going to have virtual reality support as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot here with this title that it's only like twenty nine ninety nine when it comes out. They said it's releasing at like a thirty dollar price point, and then they're gonna have all these features if you want to make your pilot look a certain way and your ship look a certain way. It's like 
very unique to the Star Wars experience that we haven't gotten in, in quite some time. It is. I really like how customizable a lot of things, you know, in-game are. I can already see someone modding, like, a VR headset to have, like, the Star Wars, like, an Imperial, oh like, helmet over it. That sounds someone so Someone needs cool. to make one of those. I need it in my life right now. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so ready to try this game out. This is, this is one of those that I'm like, could this potentially, this is like a, I think I brought this up in lots of competitions competitive shooter type games that could you see a star wars squadrons jump to esports i think that's like your signature question of when there's a cool multiplayer game is like yeah. esport could it be an esport because like for me i'm always like there's so many games that just kind of like they're there and they're always there with esports right mm -hmm. and they don't go away counter-strike overwatch call of duty um mm -hmm. you know fortnite but now it's like could we see something like this with as big of an intellectual property as Star Wars be like, hey, we have a Star Wars squadrons? Like, I mean, they could handle the funding. There's no, oh, there's totally. no problem for Disney to be like, hey, oh my God. we're just going to do our own esports for rogues, for, for, for squadrons. Uh, but that would be, that would actually be really cool. Yeah, if there was, a, you know, an esport that had, you know, Disney money backing it, I could already see the production being top notch, you know, all the equipment would be, you know, perfectly handled, you know, all yeah. the cameras, the spectating mode, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I hope that the user base is going to be big enough. I think a lot of people are going to be jumping into squadrons. I hope it's not a game that, you know, gets a little bit of hype launch day and then kind of goes under the radar. I hope people, you know, will be playing this game because it looks really fun. Right. And I hope it's as fun, you know, as it seems from the cinematics you know, from the trailers that we've seen. And I think if there's a big enough player base and maybe we could really see, you know, a big competitive scene out of this. Does it also mean, and I am, I, I hope, I don't know if they've, they've talked about this, but they might address this. Does it also mean like you should play this game with a joystick? Like an actual, like maybe. one of the flight simulator joysticks? Because mm -hmm. that is not something I've I've owned in a long time since like way back when, when PCs like first had them and you'd, you'd get them for like the simple flying simulators that they had. Um, but could this be one of those moments where it's like, I have like my own, you know, Star Wars, you know, pilot. Do you get the Imperial one? Do you get the uh, the Rebel one? Yeah. That, would be a, that would be really cool if they started to like release those types of uh, uh, ancillary uh, devices. That would be super cool. Now I'm just like adding that to my like imaginary wish list is like real, you know, Star Wars Squadrons VR rig with joystick, yeah. you know, with my gamer chair, yeah. like ready to go. Yeah. Yeah, and, and controller at least. There's no way I could play that. Flying games with mouse and keyboard see, are like, they just, they're- Seems rough. They just don't feel compatible. It yeah. just doesn't feel like it's meant for it whatsoever. <laughs> LOLOL, stop. We won't, you can't make us. <laughs> um, so to get into a little bit of bummer of news, yeah. Sony reportedly has cut PS5 production by 4 million units. So tomorrow, we know that we get that PlayStation 5 showcase that starts at 1 p.m. Um, and many of us are hoping, really hoping that we'll finally get a launch date and the actual price for Sony's next-gen console. Who knows if we will or not at this point, but it does seem as if some things behind the scenes may not be super rosy for Sony, and it's not their own fault. So in a recent report from Bloomberg, it has been reported that Sony has cut back the initial production units for the PS5 by 4 million units, going from ordering 15 million units by the end of March 2021 to 11 million. But this is not due to a lack of demand or Sony restructuring expectations. The culprit is on the production side. As alleged in the article, production yields of the console system on chip has fallen behind up to 50%, cutting into the amount they had hoped to produce. Citigroup's analysts, including Kota Ezawa, wrote in response to the report of Sony's revised production target, saying that if the news is accurate, we would view the reduction as negative. The analysts also pointed out that the challenges with the SOC yields would increase the component's cost and weight of profit margins. Sony's lowered forecast is only an estimate and could be revised again before the end of the fiscal year in March 2021. It was reported last month that the company had doubled their production orders, and it seems that ended up being a bit too much. The article states that yield has actually been steadily improving, but it's still not stable enough for the original order. And of course, we do need to take these reports kind of like we take rumors, but Bloomberg does tend to have a good record because yesterday we did hear that Sony is using air freights to make sure that they meet demands for the PlayStation 5 in the US as much as possible. Even if this article is accurate, 
11 million units produced by March 2021 is still quite ambitious. We do have our fingers crossed that it will equate to enough stock to go around either way. I think that, you know, this sucks, but I'm glad that it's not Sony being like, oh, I don't think that people are going to buy these consoles or, you know, a logistics problem, really, because I think that was the main concern, you know, after the whole pandemic hit was like, will they be able to, you know, ship out all these units? Will they be able to move them? But this is actually a problem with one of the chips being um, being made, not, you know, anything to do with logistics or demand necessarily. Yeah. And and, and to like what Seppel and, and Guff were saying, Bloomberg is, is very good about what they're reporting to be accurate and factual and and just like hey here's the news as it is with no you know bias other than maybe some experts giving their input what they think could happen Mm -hmm. um this makes sense with the whole situation regarding the pandemic that production costs are 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 hard to be met especially with these chips all these chips are happening in other parts of the world Mm -hmm. i don't this is my personal opinion on this matter and i don't know why this hasn't been looked into or they're not solving this problem but a lot of individuals in the 3d printing space have expressed that chips like these manufacturers need could Mm -hmm. be printed here in the states interesting you don't have to actually go and wait to for another part in the world to produce the chips manufacture them and send them to you Mm -hmm. it would actually cut that off and wow. uh, there was a huge like Vice article that did like a big report on this, mm-hmm. how right now with everything going on, we could shift in that way and we'll still actually meet the the expectations, if not supersede them with just printing them uh, uh, state sides in, 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 you know, in various warehouses across the land. I don't know why they're not looking into that or at least <laughs> attempting to make that technology current because mm-hmm. I think they'll get a bad public outlash if they're not actually enough consoles to go around for the people who want them come the holiday 2020 season. I hope that they're going to say something that quells some concerns because as people say, I will cry, you know, if I don't get, you know, PlayStation 5, you know, on launch date or when it comes out. Um, also, people are concerned that, you know, others are going to buy up a bunch of units and try to sell them at a higher price which is our initial concern um which was quelled and now it's back again i i really hope that you know at least we're going to you know have enough right at launch um this is just more reason for you to get your pre-orders in and kind of decide early you know what kind of console you're going to get yeah, that, that is very important here because those, you can go to, I think there's like four different websites you can sign up on and get pre-orders that have it, GameStop, um, uh, Best Buy, Amazon, and Sony itself. You mm-hmm. can sign up to get notified of when pre-orders are live because, yeah, we're probably going to see some individuals try to figure out how to wiggle around the policy that Sony said that they're going to instill, which is one per purchase so like if you Mm -hmm. uh if you buy one how are they going to tie that in maybe it's debit card i don't know the way they're going to protect that we already know that someone's out there like i'm going to buy five of them oh yeah get them out on ebay for a hundred times the cost or whatever and someone's gonna be like i need it and, and and spend that Totally. Thank you so much, Kane, for giving a sub to Artistic Charmer. Hey. Enjoy your Thank emotes. You, Kane. Welcome totally. to the subs, Artistic Charmer. Yo, welcome, welcome. It's totally a concern. I hope we're not going to see it because it benefits no one except, you know, the skeevy people who want to, you know, t- yeah. take take advantage of that. It just reminds me of that episode of The Office with the unicorn princess dolls with Dwight Schrute oh, buying yeah. it all up. Oh my God. Because this is for yeah. holiday 2020. What if there's like a little kid yeah. who's been like begging for a PS5 He's selling all year? The office. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that That's doesn't so happen. <laughs> I hope it doesn't either. Don't don't be a Dwight Schrute, y'all. Don't be a Dwight Schrute. Do not do it. So for tomorrow's PS5 Showcase event, we're just going to let you know, you know, when it is. It's going to be during our new show, but also what you're going to, what you should be expecting. So that PlayStation 5 Showcase is scheduled for Wednesday, September 16th. Sony announced this. The event will focus on the PlayStation 5's upcoming games, including a look at those coming at launch and beyond. And if you haven't made your mind up on purchasing the next-gen console yet, this actually could be your chance because we might finally learn that much anticipated price and release date as there are other numerous questions for Sony to potentially address as well, including details on backwards compatibility, 
launch lineup, and more. So Sony on the PlayStation blog said, before PlayStation 5 launches this holiday, we wanted to give you one more look at some of the great games coming to PS5 at launch and beyond. So we know they start in the U.S. at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. In the U.K., it's 9 p.m. Uh, BST in Australia, it's 6 a.m. AET. So we might go ahead and probably dedicate the whole episode tomorrow to this event because this is a really big event. Uh, we, we probably will, you know, just do a live react with all of you. Um, so we'll be streaming it here. Sony is officially broadcasting it on its Twitch and YouTube pages, as well as the official PlayStation website. The live stream is going to be about 40 minutes, according to a post on the PlayStation blog, which is the perfect amount of time for us to watch it and do a debrief. Um, yeah. It's also streaming on GameSpot, if you're a big GameSpot fan. And what to expect is this, is, is critical information about the PlayStation 5, namely its price and release date remain unknown. And Sony knows they need to address this. It's possible we could get information on those things now that Microsoft has revealed them for the Series X and Series S. More importantly, Xbox pre-orders open on September 22nd, and Sony may want to get this information in front of consumers before that date. So the event will be games focused and will feature updates on first party and third party games. We know that Spider-Man Miles Morales and Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart are both scheduled to release near the system's launch, but neither has a firm release date yet. And other games such as the Demon Souls remake don't have release windows yet. And there isn't an official update for the PlayStation 5 version of Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, but it releases three days after Microsoft systems. Having that available as a launch title for the PlayStation 5 would certainly be a big deal. However, it will also be one of the player's first introductions to the new $70 price that we'll see for certain next-gen games. Take-Two is similarly pricing games at this level, while other companies such as Ubisoft or Ubisoft have not done so yet. Sony may have no choice but to share price and release information for the PS5 now that Microsoft has revealed the Xbox Series X and Series S, and those are set to release on November 10th. While the Series X will cost $500, the less powerful Series S will cost $300. I think it's technically $499 and $299, but... So the strategy is different from Sony's, where the only difference between the PS5 and PS5 digital systems is a disk drive. Because of this, it's unlikely there will be an enormous price difference between the two PS5 models, but we'll know for sure soon, as well as how aggressive Sony gets with the PS5 pricing. Yeah, Sony's, Sony, I, I hope the very beginning of tomorrow's showcase is price launch date. I hope it is, like yes. right out the gate. Here's what it's going to cost, here's when it's going to launch, here's what you're going to get. I hope they don't do the whole, we're going to wait till the 39th minute to let you oh, know God. that information. And I hope we also get, you know, a definitive list of when you buy this console, you will be able to play these games. Because I know there has been a little bit of wiggle room with some game launches. Some some are moving a few days earlier, you know, to yeah. line up with the release of the consoles. Um, so I'm excited to see, you know, what the actual roster is going to be. Yeah, and, and that's also important. The, the conversation about backwards compatibility has been one that, a lot of consumers want to know what games will I still get to play on the next gen console that I currently have now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think they should hopefully at least address the rumored or at least confirmed aspect of their like their streaming service that will allow you to play all of the PlayStation games, but just on the PlayStation 5. They had mm -hmm. mentioned that the PlayStation Now would kind of like become that emulator for those games. Right. Um, I hope that that is is true, and I know it was something that was just kind of like being tossed around in the in the conversation of solving that problem because so many people. I get it. I, I don't necessarily relate to it, but so many people want to be able to play like a PlayStation One game on their PlayStation Five hardware. Um, they do. Um, I think that there's this mentality, at least with PC players, that you know if it's an old PC game, you can still play it now, and a lot of console players want that as well. I personally don't think about consoles that way where I'm kind of like this gen console can play this gen games you know I don't I'm not going to pull out my old like OG Xbox titles from the closet and put them into you know a series X and expect it to work necessarily but that is what a lot of people demand yeah and I would hope and do actually uh, expect a type of surprise at this event because Sony has seemingly done that each time they've done some sort of like here's some information you didn't expect whatsoever um, they did that with the last event when they showed the console. Right. Everybody was like, we're not mm -hmm. going to see the console. Wait, we saw the console? 
I want to believe that we'll finally get to see like a PSVR 2 tech demo or a PSVR yes. 2 game in action so you can kind of get a glimpse into what virtual reality for the PlayStation 5 is going to be like. Yeah, they always have, you know, like a, an extra card to pull. There's always a surprise news that comes out. Um, I also wanted to share this kind of meme tweet that I saw. Oh, um, please. That said, whoever named PlayStation 2 PlayStation 2 deserves a retroactive pay raise in no less than the eight digits range because IGN tweeted on a September 13th that, okay, just, just bear with me with this sentence. The Xbox Series S will not run Xbox One X enhanced versions of backwards compatible games, but will instead run Xbox One S versions of Xbox One and Xbox 360 titles. And I was just like, what's happening? Yeah, that makes me think of the, the meme that's the, uh, uh, what's his name from Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and he's standing with the board and it's got all the Oh yes, the, the, the like, red string. To, yeah. Yeah, the other one is like the math equations going on inside yeah. the people's heads so that they're trying to figure out what was just said. Right, yeah, that was a real, eyes that was a real, over. That was a real tweet? That was a real tweet from IGN, yes. Wow. And, like, it's also <laughs> terrible that it's called the Xbox Series S and there's the Xbox One S and people already have a hard time differentiating between the Xbox One X or what Xbox Series X and Xbox Series S, let alone the Xbox One X and the Xbox One S. And I think they tried to, you know, keep them parallel with the Xbox One S and X and the Series S and X, but it's just too many sounds happening. It's just, also too many similarities, S and yes, X. That's a very right. easy thing to potentially, did I hear you correct? Did you say S or X? Yeah. Uh, why they didn't just go with like Xbox Series P? You know what I mean? Boom, right, it's not it there. Up. G, T, give me something that's not close to S or X. Why would you do that to us? Right, or they could just like totally change the name. I know the code names for these consoles yeah. are I think Lockhart and Scarlet. Like, those Scarlet, are that's a cool, cool name. Just do the it, Xbox just go Scarlet, with that. The Xbox Scarlet, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's the Xbox Series S. So what are you doing? Dumb. What are you doing? Stop it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. So um, I, I can always trust PlayStation and Sony to be very, you know, clear cut and logical yeah. with Mark Cerny and you know just calling yeah. it a PlayStation Five, you know, digital I think the other, or not. Yeah. The other joke I saw was like the place, the PlayStation Four. You know why it's called the PS Four? Because it's the fourth console. Whoa! I was, I was like, whoa! But you're like, yeah. Maybe Xbox should have just stuck with the the, the numerical system of continuing oh from one and on. That was like when they came out with the Xbox One. You were like, what? We've already got a yeah. one. That was the first one, right? Right. That, that was the first one. And I was also thinking, okay, so it's like Xbox, and then it does it 360, and then it's okay. one, but it's like back in place already. I don't I don't know. Yeah, whole... not a 720 because right. of full yeah. 360. Pull it yeah. a 680. Yeah, I don't know. We could do a whole segment on trying to explain <laughs> this. To, we should bring someone on who knows nothing about games and yes. attempt to explain to them the history Please. of the Xbox consoles and be like, so what did you take away from this? That would be great. Just be like, yeah, if you could sum up for me, you know, how the Xbox generations go, like, please explain to us. I doubt they'll be able to do it. Yeah, that would be such a funny thing to do. Oh, my God. I, I, I am excited about this event tomorrow because I'm, I'm believing we're finally going to get this information that we've all been speculating on, and I, I'm 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 genuinely hoping they match Xbox's model of of maybe not necessarily exact pricing, but at least that monthly cost at getting in on the uh, the PlayStation. But with the production unit report, it might not be possible for them to actually uh, uh, s stick that through. You know, you know, be able to sell that many. I wonder how many people are going to kind of preemptively sign up for a pre-order, and then I don't. I know some places you can cancel them, some you can't. I, I wonder, you know, how that's going to work. If, um, you know, too many people are just going to sign up to be like, I just wanted to sign up in case I didn't get a PlayStation Five, um, kind of thing. But I also want to see, you know, the price point. I want to see if there's a subscription service. I want to see the games at launch. I want to see something cool like PSVR as kind of an extra that's yeah. not necessary. Um, and also, you know, I I don't need more reasons to buy a PS Five because I'm already planning on buying a PS5, yeah. but I yeah, think they do, I, I already know what I want, but I think they do need to show why you should spend the money getting a PS5 instead of getting an Xbox Series S. Absolutely. So we'll have to tune in tomorrow because that does bring us to the end of the Daily Gaming News Hour for September 15th, 2020. Today was an awesome hour of amazing news going on in the gaming industry.
Thank you so much for joining us today for our hour of daily gaming news. Tomorrow we're going to be covering that PS5 event all stream, so stay tuned. Uh, maybe we'll throw a little bit of other news in there, but it will be mainly about the PS5. And also, thank you so much for uh, gifting the, the subs and for those of you subscribing and for the follows and, and just the overall uh, uh, love and appreciation from the DGN family. We really uh, appreciate you. And Guff, I'm actually going to be streaming today. I'm probably going to hop on my own stream in like 30 minutes or so. I'm going to be trying to play primarily with controllers. So we'll see what happens. Nice. Maroon watch party. Let's all hang Yay. out. <laughs> uh, we're going to be running reruns after this per usual. So if you want to stick around, um, we also like running reruns so more people find our show because if the channel's only live for an hour, you know, that's not a lot of discoverability. So, you know, to keep the channel going, um, we're posting videos on our YouTube as well as certain segments. If you haven't seen the quantum error interview, it was killer. Make sure you check that out yeah and if you have anybody that you know that works in the gaming industry or is involved in some uh, uh area of the gaming industry please send them our way we can bring them on and talk to them we love to just continue to grow the conversation with experts and professionals in the field that is gaming so you can drop that in exclamation point mailbag. Please don't feel like you're spamming the mailbag. We love all your responses. Yes. Make sure to sign your name if you don't want it to be anonymous um, because it is just a very, you know, general open form. Absolutely. So thank you all so much again, everybody at the DGN family. We love and appreciate you and for continuing uh, uh, to support us and get behind us. But for Daily Gaming News today, September 15th, 2020, we are signing off. I am Marone. I am Kaisa. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, everybody.